You are about to listen to an extract from one of the Chavos novels, written for children aged nine plus, by the author, Anna McCann. The Sewers Carlos squeezed into his rubber, airtight diving suit, prizing on his helmet and gloves, and waited until his colleagues connected him to various steel chains and pulleys, before lowering him into the sewer. He disappeared into the filthy water, his only contact with the world, a radio microphone, inside his bright yellow helmet. I'm always fearful when he's down there, mumbled his partner Victor to the journalist, who was doing an article on various city sewer networks for a national magazine. Keep talking, dude, he called, turning to the reporter. I'm at ease if I can hear him. If he goes quiet for too long, I panic. I have lost two mates in the last three years doing this job and I don't want to lose any more. What happened? asked the reporter. His name, David Pritchard. And in contrast to the small overweight Carlos, he was tall, exceedingly skinny and looked as though he needed a good meal. Swept away by an unexpected rush of water, we suspect. There are over 600 miles of sewers and pipes below this city, explained Victor. Someone has to keep them flowing, otherwise this great city will grind to a halt. We've had thousands of homes flooded because the system has become blocked. How long will he be down there? inquired Pritchard. Till he finds the blockage. It's pitch black and a torch is no good to him. He's just going to have to feel his way around. What? No, seriously. We don't want him down there more than 20 minutes. It's about 24 feet down and will be very cold. Not talking from experience, mind. You wouldn't get me doing that job. I've got it, shouted Carlos. Good work, man, hollered Victor. That was quick going. Carlos proceeded to struggle with a pile of junk, including bottles, plastic bags, and what he thought was the body of a small animal. Managing to prise it free, there was suddenly a gush of water and the system was flowing again. As Victor and his colleagues hauled him up to the surface, David Pritchard reeled back in horror. The stench was horrendous. He felt violently sick, his stomach somersaulting several times over. Thank God he was a reporter and not a deep slime diver for the City Water Corporation, he thought. His work colleagues tossed buckets of soapy water over Carlos and the slime and filth began to slide away. To David Pritchard's amazement, Carlos removed his helmet to display a smiling face. I love my job, he said. That was easy. Wish it was always that simple. Not so easy when I find bodies blocking the drains, especially little ones, if you get my meaning. David Pritchard knew exactly what Carlos meant. He knew there were kids living in the sewers. And being a father himself, it didn't bear thinking about. Agreeing to interview Carlos and his colleagues at the end of the working day over a cool beer and a few tacos, the journalist made a quick escape. Nightfall came and the workers were gone. The streets lay quiet and deserted. Suddenly... A grating sound could be heard as a manhole cover slid sideways, exposing a dark hole from which emerged the dirty face of a boy, about 17 years of age. He shouted, and within seconds, 
a horde of filthy kids all emerged, following silently behind. The educator, the one who had been brave enough to visit them from the crisis centre, to try and persuade them to leave the streets and go to the nearby shelter for homeless children, had now given up. So had the Catholic priest, once full of faith, but who now refused to visit, having been chased off on two or more occasions by a kid brandishing a knife. As far as he was concerned, it was in God's hands now. The police, well for them, the streets at night in this part of town were a no-go area. The kids were living in the sewers below the highway, only a short distance away from where Carlos had been working earlier. He had encountered a few kids himself over the years. They didn't bother him knowing he had a job to do. They just let him get on with it. The kids to many in society had become untouchable, branded sewer rats by some. They were a law unto themselves. Mousy was the first one out, followed by Cougar, Jackal, Tortuga, and then Fat Boy. These kids were mean, nasty and dangerous. No one messed with them unless they were brave or very stupid. Each of them seemed to suit their nickname perfectly. They were the untouchables. Their ages unknown, never had birth certificates. Most of them themselves had no idea how old they were. Each day was the same, week in, week out. Nothing much changed. The question hanging over them was, who would be next? Who was going to die or be killed today? Death was acceptable. Sadly, life had no value unless by some great miracle of fate one of them escaped from this godforsaken place. They didn't like chicas. The word female didn't come into their vocabulary and they hated the other gangs living in the city. The untouchables were out, all of them looking for food, action and anything to pass the time. The Molinas were also around a few blocks away. They were not armed. The untouchables, however, had every piece of nasty equipment you could imagine. Halcon, the one named Hawk, because he was supposed to keep watch, was paired with Silbar, the whistler. But Halcon was clearly not on form and failed to notice the activity at the end of the street. Consequently, Silbar never sent up the signal and soon the untouchables found themselves face to face with the Molinas. Silbar whistled and the rumble was over in seconds. It was the Molinas fault for crossing into untouchable territory. A fatal lapse of foolishness left one dead Molina, three slightly wounded untouchables and Tortuga missing. Like sewer rats, they quickly dived back into the drain, the last one replacing the manhole cover. One body in a pool of blood left behind on the sidewalk. Fifteen untouchables had left the sewer. Only fourteen returned. Tortuga, like most of the kids, was so doped up he barely knew the time of day. He had fallen into the hands of the Molinas, who pushed him several blocks on an old juice cart to their base, the Molina House, an old derelict building which suited their purpose as well. In actual fact, Tortuga used to hang out with them and had been missing for ages. We found Tortuga, shouted one of the kids who had recognised him instantly. He's a mess. But it's Tortuga, all right. Hey, Cheeto man, cried Beanie. I thought he was dead. It's been months since he took off after that bust up at the house. I wondered what had happened to him. Well, 
He's obviously been living in the sewers. Sometime later, a few blocks away, at the makeshift shelter behind the metro, a group of other kids gathered. That sounds scary, said the little one who had been listening to the Chavos talking about the rumble between the Molinas and the Untouchables. Some kid is dead and the police are talking about going down into the sewers and flushing those kids out, remarked one. Trouble is, I think it's all talk, because no one really wants to go down there, do they? Well, the government will have to do something now, came the voice of the priest as he peered around the shelter entrance, interrupting the conversation and startling everyone. They're just on the case now and have sent a team down to clear out one of the sewers. Some dude who works for the Water Authority has gone down to check on another reported blockage and found several bodies. The rumour is it could be as many as 30 homeless kids down there and all dead through toxic fumes, I suspect. Oh, gross. Oh, murmured one of the kids. David Pritchard was reporting and managed to get into the press conference where a statement was about to be released by the Water Authority, along with an interview with the team who had made the grim discovery. He was not surprised when Carlos and Victor took their seats. The debate raged. Representatives from the government said that every effort would be made to avoid such a catastrophe again. Reports were requested from Carlos and Victor and their team who could offer information as to which sewers in the city might be inhabited by the homeless. The crisis centre workers, the Catholic priest, people from all walks of life had an opinion. The government issued a writ to clear out all known sewers immediately. But no one had an answer to the question, where will its occupants go next? Mousy was the first one out. He always was. Followed by Cougar, Jackal and Fat Boy. All late teens. They were the lucky ones. They inhabited a different sewer to the dead kids. David Pritchard looked on, mortified. Two younger kids crawled out, not much older than his own son of nine years. He wanted the story. He needed to know their story. Most of all, how and why had these kids tragically chosen such a horrific existence? When he had been commissioned to do the story for the magazine on the city water system, he never expected it to develop quite like this. His next article surely had to be to follow the lives of those who were evicted. Indeed, the question in his mind, what next?